Good morning, students. Today we're going to be going through Chapter 3, uh, Fetal Development. This is just um, a short chapter, shouldn't take too long, and I'm just going to quickly go through um, the parts that I think you need to know. When we are talking about fetal development, we're um, really talking about what happens after fertilization. So uh, it, uh, we already talked about this a little bit, but in your um, each cell, you have DNA, and the DNA is what tells your cell what to become, how to duplicate, where to go, and, and what its function is. So each uh, in the human body, we have 46 chromosomes, which is 22 pairs, so we get 22 from our mother and 22 from our father. And then that last set is the one that decides whether we're a male or a female. We either get an X from our father or we get a Y from our father. We always get an X from our mother. So XX makes a female, XY makes a male. And lots of things in our, um, in our genes and in our DNA can be... Uh, there are lots of things in the environment that can actually influence that. So for instance, there are things called tetragens that can actually change our DNA. Some of those are medications. Some of those are street drugs, like ecstasy is, is actually able to change our DNA. Um, under nutrition, not having enough nutrition will definitely change our DNA and affect how we uh, pass on our genes and smoking influences our DNA. So this is what I was just talking about, 23 pairs, sex is determined by the male, it's either an X or a Y, and it's determined at conception. Now there are some ideas out there that we can influence which sperm make it to the egg. Um, the males are faster, but they die sooner, and the females are slower, but they live longer. So depending on when that egg is released, there's some idea that you could potentially influence what kind of um, baby you're going to have, whether it's a male or a female. Um, one thing I've noticed culturally is that a lot of times the mother is actually blamed for having a female child, for instance. In some cultures, it's not as um, uh, revered. It's not looked upon as, uh, as, as nicely if you have a female. And then the woman, the mother, is actually held responsible when actually it's the father's responsibility to give us that, that uh, gene that determines whether it's male or female. Just an interesting little side fact. So here is just a look at the egg and the sperm. The egg is actually a very large cell, and this is, of, of course, under a microscope many, many thousands of times. And then the sperm is um, a very small cell and it has parts and pieces to it so here you have the head and the body and the tail and the tail is what allows it to move and find the egg there's um some interesting uh research right now that the egg actually decides which sperm is going to be able to enter and there's uh, uh, been a lot of research for a long time that we are attracted sexually to people that would be a good genetic match for us. Has to do with hormones, has to do with pheromones. Um, a lot of things are going on in our heads and in our bodies that maybe we aren't conscious of when we're looking for a mate. So fertilization actually takes place when this one of these sperm actually enters the body of the cell. Once the head enters, the tail kind of falls off, and then that genetic material is deposited into the cell, and that's when we say that fertilization has happened, and um, that is when new life has been created. Um, usually takes place somewhere in the ovary, I'm, I'm sorry, somewhere in the fallopian tube. So I showed you in our last video how the egg is, um, is kind of explodes out of the ovary and then it finds its way into the fallopian tube. The sperm comes up and meets it. And then if it's fertilized, it will start to roll back down towards the, towards the uterus. Once one of the sperm has actually penetrated the egg, um, then no more sperm are allowed in. And you're going to ask me, well, what about twins? Well, twins are when you have two eggs and two different sperm that fertilize them, or you have um, an egg and sperm that have been fertilized, and then very quickly, within the first few times it divides, it makes two separate 
people. That's when you have identical twins. We'll talk more about that. So here's just another picture. This is the egg developing. It's being released into the fallopian tube. The sperm has come up from the vagina and met that egg. And the egg says, yes, you may enter. And then the sperm enters and deposits its genetic material. And now the genes go about replicating and making a new human. So we should talk about um, how long sperm can actually be uh, alive. A lot of people think that um, you know they die pretty quickly. So one of the things we tell our patients that are not wanting to get pregnant is that we have to be very careful because those sperm can actually live up to five days. I personally know somebody that had um, uh, that conceived nine days after she had had intercourse. It had. It, it was nine days before she ovulated and um, those sperm were still alive and she was able to become pregnant. So, um, it, you know, if people are using the rhythm method of contraception, we call those people parents, by the way, but if they're using the rhythm method where they're just trying to time their uh, sexual activity around when they ovulate, they have to know five days before they ovulate and five days after those sperm could still be alive. So again, this is the sex determination. I already talked about this. Male determines the gender. The pH of the reproductive tract can actually influence it. XX makes a female. XY results in a male. And inheritance is very interesting to me. These, this is a picture. It's a little bit blurry, but this is a picture of um, two parents that have had a, a set of twins, and one of them got some of the genetic material that is from one of these parents that have some Caucasian um, genes. Maybe one of their parents is Caucasian. And so they have one child that ended up looking very much like them and one child that has um, some genetic material from grandparents or even great grandparents. So it's really interesting how um, genetics pass on their material. It's not always carbon copies. And then on the other side of that, sometimes you can see families that you know they belong in the same family. In fact, if you don't even know them, you might say, wait, do you have a brother or a sister because they look so much alike? So there's such a thing as dominant and recessive genes, and we'll talk just a little bit about that. Um, they, the, that is what's going to be expressed. So obviously this was a recessive, and she is expressing that gene. So once the egg and sperm have joined, they start going through rapid transformation. Now, every stage that I'm going to talk about is actually uh, an entire specialty. You could spend an, your entire career learning and discovering and, and um, studying the zygote, for instance. I'm not going to ask you to remember all the different names of the embryo before you even get to fertilization. I'm just going to talk about it very quickly here, just so you have some idea of what I'm talking about. So once the zygote is formed, which is the union of the sperm and the egg, it starts to travel down that fallopian tube. The size of the zygote does not increase, but the cells become smaller as they start to divide. So it makes this big ball of cells. Um, as it starts to move down. It usually enters the uterus about the third day and then it floats around for another two to four days. It is not even embedded in the uterus yet. Implantation hopefully happens in the upper section of the um, posterior wall of the uterus and I'll talk about that in a second and that is when the cells start to actually burrow down into the lining of the uterus which has not been expelled through a period this month it that's that's actually what our period is every month is getting it, it it's getting uh, our we go through the cycle where we actually get the walls ready of the uterus to receive a fertilized egg and then when that doesn't happen it's shed and that is what the period is. So here are, um, again, just pictures of what the cells look like as they start to divide before it has even gotten into the uterus. So um, cell differentiation, where the cells start to go where um, they're programmed to go very quickly after they start to divide. And in the fetus, they're going to all have special functions. Some of them are going to become the chorion and amnion, which make up the amniotic sac. And then there's going to be the primary germ layers. I'm going to talk just a little bit about um, what happens. But here you can see that this egg is getting ready to burrow down into the cells of the uterus. Sorry, it's not an egg anymore. It's an embryo. 
So here is a picture of a very early um, uh, miscarriage, but you can see how the sac has already been formed and there's already fluid in there. So like I mentioned, the chorion and amnion are what form the amniotic sac. So there's two layers. And when we're in class, I'm going to show you in my model um, what that looks like. But that's how later on when it's time for the baby, when we're close to um, uh, delivery, how you can have leaking of fluid and then still have a big gush later because there's actually two layers of that bag. Amniotic fluid should be clear, has a mild odor. Sometimes it contains a little bit of vernix, which is that cheesy white substance that allows the baby to um, be in water for all that time and not become pruney. It keeps it's waterproof. And then lanugo is a very fine hair that is um, on a fetus when it's in the uterus. And sometimes you see a little bit of it when it's born. So the volume of this fluid steadily increases from about 30 mLs at 10 weeks to about um, a, a liter of fluid at the time of uh, term when it should be delivered. So here's just a visual representation. This is how much fluid uh, the fetus has. It's about the size of a urine cup. And then here's just a liter of fluid. So this is a full-term baby, and you can see the amnion and chorion surrounding this baby, and all this fluid should be about a liter at that time. So the function of the amniotic fluid is very important. It maintains the temperature of this baby. It also prevents the sac from adhering to the skin. If there's not enough fluid on the inside, sometimes you'll see something called an amniotic band syndrome where um, an, a limb doesn't develop appropriately because there's not enough fluid in there to keep that sac from, from adhering to the skin. It also allows the baby to move around and, and move its arms and wiggle and kick its legs. And that is what uh, helps to strengthen its muscles once it gets closer to being born. And it acts as a cushion to prevent the baby from umbilical cord injury. So the amniotic fluid is very important. The other thing that needs to happen is this baby is going to be breathing that fluid in and out, and that's what's exercising the lungs and actually helping to develop them. Babies that have some sort of a condition where they are not producing enough amniotic fluid, because the fluid is, um, a majority of it comes from the baby. It's actually urine um, produced by the baby, but the the um, if there's not enough of it in there, the baby will continue to develop, but then the lungs don't develop, and so we can have what's called hypoplastic lungs, and this baby can be full-term but not have developed lungs and not be able to survive outside of the mother. Okay, so here's those primary germ layers that I was talking about. Um, it, it, this is interesting to me, and this is another, another um, area where you could spend an entire career just learning about this. But as these cells start to develop, you've got that big mass of cells, they start to form into tubes. And so we have the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm, and each one of those tubes become part of our um, body, part of, part of our system. So the ectoderm is actually the outer layer, and that's what develops into skin, hair, lining of the nose, lining of the nervous system, lining of the mouth. The endoderm, which is that inner layer, starts to develop into the digestive tract, the respiratory tract, the liver, the pancreas. And then the mesoderm starts to develop our muscles and our skeleton. So it's just fascinating how all these cells know what to do and where to go based on their uh, DNA programming. So this is just another picture of how these cells start to form. A lot of problems um, that we see later in the baby happen at this time. And this is very early on within the first two to three weeks of development. And most women don't even know that they're pregnant at this time. So when I was talking about those influences that can uh, influence um, our DNA, if this woman is smoking, drinking, doing drugs, taking medication, those things could all actually influence the development at this time and could um, create uh, a, a incompatibility with life for this fetus. So this is why it's so important that women are planning, that are planning to become pregnant, um, act like they already are, and, and watch their um, activities. So three stages of prenatal development. 
that that um, zygote is when the cell is formed. So that's what first starts to happen. Then we have the embryo stage, which is the second to the eighth week of development. So this is usually when a mother finds out that she's pregnant and hopefully she's been acting like she already is and watching her um, her her activities. And then the fetus is from the ninth week until birth. Age of viability is one of those um, gray areas. This is one of those places that we can have long ethical conversations. So I'm sure that somewhere along the line, you've heard that a baby can survive as young as 19 weeks gestation, which is not even halfway through the pregnancy. The reality is um, those babies do not survive. They may survive for a little while with a lot of medical care. But when you say survive, you have to define that. Do you mean survive, grow up, go to kindergarten, learn how to read, um, become an independent adult? Or do you mean survive as in stay alive with millions of dollars worth of medical care every year and never do any of those things that I mentioned? So when you see those stories, uh, there's, there's a couple of things going on. One is maybe they weren't really 19 weeks. Maybe they were further along. Um, a 19-week embryo still has their eyes fused and their lungs are not developed enough to live outside of the body. No matter what we do for them, they are not going to be able to survive. Um, and so age of viability is usually defined as uh, where a, a baby can or a fetus can live independently from its mother. And so we know that it's approximately 23 to 24 weeks that the baby might survive. And again, this is going to be your million dollar baby that is going to need 20 weeks of medical care in order to be able to live independently and may have long term um, uh, health problems, uh, even if they do survive. So all babies that are born before 34 weeks will spend time in the NICU, no doubt, because they are not developed enough to live outside of the mom without some medical help. So in the NICU, they um, actually recreate the lots of the environment that the baby had on the inside. So I'm getting ready to show you a picture of what some of these very early babies look like. So be forewarned, these are graphic pictures. So this is a 19 week baby. This baby you can see has very translucent skin. Its eyes are still fused. This baby's lungs are not developed. Sometimes we do see babies um, at this age born alive, but there's nothing we can do to keep them alive. We tell their mothers, um, hold them, love them, and let them go peacefully. We don't even have tubes small enough to help these babies breathe. So that's a 19 weeker. This is a 24, probably 23, 24 weeker. And you can see this is still very much a fetus, even though it's a month um, <clears throat> older than this one. It's very much a fetus and it's going to require long-term care in the NICU and that's what this baby is in. You can see it has a breathing tube here. We will have to feed it. It is not going to be able to suck. It will have IVs, probably has umbilical lines here using the umbilical cord as an IV site which we can do for a while. Um, this baby is going to need a lot of care to get to the point where it can live independently and go home. And we're going to talk more about this when we talk about the preemie. I just wanted to give you some um, examples of it here. So the accessory structures that come with the baby um, actually form along with the baby. One of them is the placenta and the umbilical cord. Fetal circulation is very different because the placenta is acting as the, the circulatory organ for the baby until it comes out of the mother. And I'm going to spend just a minute talking about that, um, but you can spend some time looking in your book about the differences between fetal circulation and um, extra uterine life circulation. So what's important to know is that, that the placenta acts as a respiratory organ, bringing all the... Um, uh, blood cells that the baby needs, the oxygen carrying cells to the baby, removing the waste. So it's a waste removal organ as well. And then it also is an endocrine organ. So this is what tells the mother's body, we're still pregnant and we're still supporting this baby. So it acts as a, a multi-purpose organ. And it, um, HCG is one of the major hormones that it produces. So here, again, it's for fetal respiration, nutrition, and excretion. You're going to need to know that. So this is just a picture of that amniotic sac 
And then here's the placenta that has already been, um, it's, it's, the baby's been born and this is after the baby's been born and it's not attached to the mother anymore. And this has really become, um, people have always been really interested in placentas, but recently, I'd say in the last six months to a year, I've seen a large amount of people that have been convinced that this organ is something that you need not throw away. It's not a waste organ. It actually, because it is a, an excretion organ, it does collect all the things in it that your body does not want your baby to have. So it, it can be full of mercury, any pesticides sometimes um, will be in there, different bacteria will be kept from getting through to your baby. So this is, is definitely an organ of excretion. But um, somewhere along the line, um, people started really looking at folklore surrounding placentas and um, looking at what other mammals and other animals do, and they usually eat their placenta. And the reason that they do is they want to clean up their nest area, and there is some nutrition in it if you don't have nutrition readily available. So that's one of the reasons. Well, it's become very popular for humans to eat their placenta as well. Um, there's uh, locally people that will turn them into placenta capsules. And so I became very interested in this because a lot of people were asking me about it. And so I did some research and I've actually put that into your extra information on the website. Uh, you can see the, the two articles that I used to do my research and then the um, brochure that I created to give out to patients. And basically it comes down to this. By the time you cook it and dehydrate it, you have probably killed all of the any uh, potential good hormones and vitamins that are in this um, placenta. We know for sure that bacteria can be spread by eating this placenta and babies have actually become sick. And many of the claims that um, uh, the people that want to sell you this make are absolutely unfounded. There's no evidence in any of the research, and there's been lots of research done about this, that it can improve your mood, that it can um, uh, help you lose weight, that it can um, help you feel better and, and, and recover sooner after the delivery of the baby. So, But we do know that there are a large amount of hormones in it, and one of the hormones is estrogen, and that inhibits your um, prolactin, which is what makes milk. So we do think that by, we know that if there's pieces of the placenta left inside, your milk production is going to be inhibited. So if you're eating it with all those hormones, your milk production is most likely going to be inhibited. So I think a lot of what these women are experiencing are a placebo effect, but the, the risks of infection and prohibiting your milk supply probably do not outweigh any perceived benefit. So spend some time and look at that. And so when, this is just a picture of that. And this is what it actually looks like dehydrated and these are the capsules. Um, spend some time looking at this because you will have people asking you about it. And believe it or not, people will believe just about anything. Um, if I tell you that for $150 I can make you feel better after delivery, people are ready to just serve that up hot and fresh. Um, so when we are giving information to our patients, we need to give them evidence-based information. So that is why I went to the research and why I did um, you know, that work so that I could bring to them what is actually out there. I can't just say what my opinion is. We never talk about our opinion. We give them actual research. Okay, so we'll spend some time talking about that in class. So in the placenta, again, um, it is where the baby is going to be getting what it needs from the mother. And usually the maternal and fetal blood don't mix. Um, it goes through the, the spiral arteries of the placenta to get to the baby. And what's interesting is that there are two arteries in a vein. And every other place in the body, the arteries carry oxygenated blood and the vein carries deoxygenated blood. But in the placenta, it's opposite. So you can remember the two arteries in a vein. AVA is a nice little mnemonic, A-V-A, two arteries in a vein. And, and um, you just remember that it's opposite. So uh, the, the deoxygenated blood is in the artery and the oxygenated blood is in the vein. So this is the umbilical cord, and you can see this is the nice, huge vein right here, and here's one of the arteries. There's another one um, uh, kind of twisted around here. 
but um, we sometimes have to actually draw cord blood gases after delivery. So it's important for us to be able to identify which is the artery and which is the vein. So some of the things that I said before, um, the placenta will try to keep some things out, but unfortunately there are some things that get through to the baby. Most drugs get through, nicotine, viral infections can get through. Um, if the drug, if mom is using drugs, it will get through to the baby and the baby can become addicted as well. Some of these infections can cause anomalies, especially if they happen early on in that development, like we were talking about earlier. And then, of course, the baby can become infected if the bacteria or viral agents get through um, the mother's system, through the placenta, to the baby. So there are hormones. I mentioned these before. This is what is produced by the placenta, progesterone, estrogen, and HCG. HCG, human chorionic um, gonadotropin is what we are testing for when we're doing a pregnancy test. That's important to know. So here's that umbilical cord again, here looking at it from a cross cut view, here's that umbilical vein and our two thinner um, arteries. And again, it's the lifeline between the mother. Um, this uh, cord is this squishy stuff is called Wharton's jelly. And that's what kind of keeps those arteries and veins from uh, and vein from being compressed it's very important it is designed that when it hits the air it starts to harden and that's how your umbilical cord once we clamp and cut the baby's born we clamp and cut and that little piece that's still connected to the baby hardens and eventually falls off it's normally somewhere um, uh, around 22 inches. It can be so long, it can be wrapped all over the baby, and this could cause potential issues if it gets compressed. But it's not uncommon for it to be around the baby's neck. A lot of times people will say, oh, my baby was born with this cord around its neck. That's actually pretty common. Um, and we don't worry unless it's causing a problem. We've even seen true knots in cords where the babies, when it was very young, did somersaults and made a true knot. Those can become an issue if they become pulled tight. And hopefully this has set up somewhere near the center of the placenta and is not on the side of the placenta. Um, that when it was formed, we hope that it's got a nice solid entry into that placenta. So here's just another picture. And again, people have um, really become interested in their placentas. You know, 20 or 30 years ago, we saw um, some women that, that were interested in maybe making a print of it, putting in ink and making a print because it is just this amazing organ that helps this baby to survive. Um, and occasionally you'd hear of different cultures that would eat the placenta. But um, it's interesting now, I think there might have been some pop culture icon out there that did it, and now it's just become very popular. A lot of people will actually do, they will plant trees or, or bury them in the yard for fertilizer, um, and that's an appropriate use of the placenta. Okay, so here's that maternal fetal circulation that I was talking about. Um, this is your placenta down here, and as it enters the body here, you'll see that um, the blood flow actually does not go to the lungs. When the baby is in utero, you do not see blood flow to the lungs. There's no reason because the oxygen is coming from the mother. So at that moment of birth is when the baby takes a big deep breath, pushes all that fluid out of its lungs. There's a hole right here in the center of the heart that has been shunting that blood away from um, the lungs that closes up. It's a flap. It's called the ductus arteriosus, and we hope it closes up all the way. Um, so that flap shut as that baby takes its first breath and air is now circulating through those lungs. It's kind of a, a miracle every time it happens and goes well. Okay, so sometimes we can see some impaired prenatal development um, because of mom not having enough nutrients or having exposure to infection. So these babies are all the same well, this is a premature baby, but these two babies are around the same gestation. And you can see this baby obviously did not get enough. And this baby got maybe a little more than it needed. So um, it's very important what happens prenatally can actually uh, influence what happens later in life. Things like heart disease and stroke, um, exposure to toxins in utero. Uh, changes in the metabolism. A baby that's born to a diabetic mother has a much higher chance of having diabetes later in life. And we'll talk more about that when we get to the problems. 
So this is that multifetal pregnancy, like I was mentioning before. This twins occur once in every 90 pregnancies. That's natural twins. Of course, if you're using infertility treatments, then there might be, uh, you have higher chance of having twins. But this is when you either have identical twins, where very early on, this egg and sperm that have joined uh, split to become two of the exact same people with different fingerprints, which I always find very interesting, but they have the same genetic makeup. And then your fraternal twins are two eggs joined with two different sperms and just share the same uterus. So this is called um, monozygotic and this is called dizygotic. And here's a picture of those babies in utero. So what we have to tell our moms is pregnancy is very important. What you eat is going to be what you grow this baby out of. So if you're eating hot dogs and Cheetos and drinking soda, your baby's going to be made out of hot dogs and Cheetos and drinking soda. But if you're eating good, fresh, healthy food that doesn't have a lot of pesticides, you're getting enough rest so there's not a lot of uh, stress hormones in your body, you're taking care of yourself, you, you're not exposing yourself to sexually transmitted diseases, not taking drugs, not taking medications that could potentially influence it. These are the things that are so important during pregnancy. You're, you are influencing not only this generation, but especially if it's a baby girl, you're influencing her generation. Um, after that. So pregnancy is a very important time. And let's not forget what it's all about. Um, I love baby pictures. They, they didn't have this. We didn't do this kind of thing when I had my babies. And I very much grieve that I don't have pictures of my babies. So you will see lots of this kind of picture in my, um, in my lectures. Okay, that's all. If you have any questions, you know where to reach me.